Hello everyone, I'm High Treason and today, well, something a bit different. I was originally going to do this without capturing video straight from the machine because it wasn't working. I've sort of halfway fixed it. It's a bit intermittent, audio keeps going. I, I don't know, it, it's really tired. I, I can get, I've got it working again, I, I know how to finish it off. It's enough fixed for this video. And this is something a bit different, you know, usually I'm just straight up hardware porn, basically, I think is uh, how you'd describe the sort of things I like to do on this channel, but uh, I'd like to do some more discussion based videos, so this one's going to be kind of half and half, just testing the waters, you might think it's boring, it's going to be very numbers oriented, uh, but this time we are, we're going to run the standard tests that I run, but it's going to be more focused on a, a discussion and a question as to, you know, I hear a lot like, you know, uh, people don't mention Socket 4 that much. It doesn't seem like a feasible platform. It is ridiculously expensive to get hold of now. It's not the most reliable thing in the world sometimes. It, it, it's full of quacks. It's a, it's a strange platform and it, it wasn't around for very long. It didn't seem to do that great when it was new. So that makes me wonder, was it ever a good platform? Was it ever a viable solution? Was it ever not just a complete waste of money. That looks really messy on the camera though. It, it doesn't look that bad in real life, I swear. But uh, yeah, was it ever a viable solution? Well, I don't know, but I got my hands on a 66 megahertz chip, so well, we're gonna mess with that. We'll test it against a 60 megahertz one while we're here, see just how much better it is, and would it have been worth buying one? Specifically, would it have been worth getting a 66 megahertz system back in, in the days when they were relevant. So, well, I guess we'll we'll get down to business and test the bloody thing out and uh, see what we make of it. I think most people watching this are already familiar with my Socket 4 Pentium system running at 60 megahertz and I did choose a name for it in the end it's now called Zoe after a character in my book rather minor character so yeah it's kind of an odd choice I guess I said in the original video about this system I refused to overclock the original chip for fear of damaging it so I managed to get my hands my grubby hands on a 66 megahertz processor a while ago and have attempted to install it I have to be honest, I'm tired of this case's bullshit, and the system won't be staying in here, it deserves something better. Uh, I really like this system actually, uh, it's, I've grown quite attached to it. I have another board that's going to go in here, which we'll talk about when the time is right. <coughs> Meanwhile, the CPU is shiny, has the FDIV bug, and is rated for 66 MHz operation. Now, there's a good chance you're sat there right now thinking, Ah, oh, come on, 6 megahertz, that's not going to do anything important, you know, that's going to be terrible, you're not going to get much out of that, what a waste, it's, it's awful, I can see why nobody bought those, and well, you could be right on that, I mean, I, I don't think that that should be correct for some reasons, which will become apparent later in the video, but... I yeah, I don't know. I mean, I will explain it later, but yeah, I realised I adding weight to that argument is the fact that I did make a mistake in the original video about this system. I was comparing it to the Batman in that video, and I'd forgotten that those results came from running the Batman with a processor overclocked to 66 megahertz up against a Pentium overdrive. So. Yeah, that, as those scores were very close, well, we can't really rule out the thought that maybe this platform is severely bottlenecked somewhere. Which would be terrible because, yeah, bottleneck would really cripple the scores and cripple the worthfulness of... That's not even a word. Cripple the value of such a processor. I don't know. I don't think it's going to go that way, and my reasons require a certain understanding of how computers work and the knock-on effects of upgrading this particular processor. However, we shall go over that shortly. Starting up, you can see that I'm using pretty normal settings in the BIOS, and I didn't change any between upgrading the CPU. Interesting to see that 1.5 PCI divisor option there, though, that would yield a 44MHz PCI bus, which might be useful later when I encounter a board 
running VLB at 42.5 megahertz or something. You'll see. <coughs> <laughs> the Dem hard drive is failing big time, and I will be moving to SCSI in this system. So yeah, that and the case change kind of means I'm not really bothered how ugly it all looks inside right now. It, really, I hate this more than you do, but it's not permanent. As for the drive, I don't care that much. It was only ever meant as a temporary solution. I knew it was a bit sick when I installed it anyway, and it had nothing important on there. So I decided to whack it with the nearest solid object that would fit inside the case. Which it turns out was a reasonably heavy black pry bar. Same one I used to demolish some kitchen cabinets with that I later had to put back together. So yeah, uh, it gets around this thing. And it got it going again, so it wasn't a total loss. I don't recommend this method, but I didn't really care if I lost the drive and it wasn't working anyway. I thought it was worth an attempt. It appears to have dislodged the problem for now, but it still intermittently gives up sometimes. I'm not real upset about it, I've had it for over a decade and it was free, so it's done okay. I actually wasted a long time trying to figure out why the system wouldn't start, only to realise the drive wasn't running. Annoyingly, you can hear it not working, if that makes sense, in the footage of me changing the damn CPU. If only I'd noticed at the time. See if it beeps. Oh, that's a good sign the CPU's running. Now, I don't have to worry about turning it off abruptly because it's only going to boot to DOS. My shoddy benchmarking suite. I really need to update this thing, but whatever. No, no promotion of cowardly channels for me, thanks. Anyway, regular benchmarks, so we know what we're dealing with here, but I'll be quick about it, as quick as I can. Here goes. Superscape yields 70.9 over its previous 63.8. Uh, that's 11.13%. I thought that CPU was only 10% faster, which is still quite a bit, but in that case, we just achieved over unity. Right, now, before you go nuts, I don't believe that I've just violated the laws of thermodynamics, and that's a shame, because I'd love to violate thermodynamics, because I love violating things. That came out kind of wrong, but there is an explanation for why we are yielding a performance gain which seems to be somewhat higher than the processor's speed would suggest. And I did say earlier about how this particular upgrade may have a knock-on effect. And, well, I'm going to explain what I think is happening. In fact, what I'm very, very confident is happening. However, as I said, this requires an understanding of the inner workings of a computer to understand what's happening here. And this is fairly in-depth. This is real bare hardware, the guts of the motherboard, and the architecture, everything... You, your average YouTube video, your average instruction manual is not going to go this far in detail. So, yeah, try and keep up with me, because I'm going to explain what's going on. Upgrading this particular CPU has a knock-on effect because it does not use internal clock multipliers of any kind. And here's why that matters. Often today, you may upgrade a CPU, but your RAM and PCI bus are all going to be the same speed probably limited by the bus clock in the computer. Let's say that bus clock is 200 megahertz and you have a 1.2 gigahertz CPU. The CPU then most likely uses a clock multiplier of six because six times 200 is 1200. Then say you get sick of this horribly slow processor and decide to upgrade it to a 1.6 gigahertz model. Oh man, this 1.2 gigahertz processor is awful. I can barely run notepad on this thing. I really should upgrade it. I mean, I don't think I'm going to get many points in this benchmark. It's going to look absolutely crap. Oh, one million points, that's awful! We don't notice much of any improvement in your applications, despite the CPU being a whole 33% faster than your old one. Oh yeah, this new 1.6 GHz processor totally earns. It's like 33% faster. It's going to get 1.3 million points in this test. It's going to totally kick everybody else's machine that it what the fuck now why would this happen well perhaps your ram still deriving its speed from the system bus clock which hasn't changed at all 
is still running a multiplier of 4 to yield 800 MHz, which doesn't seem entirely unlikely. Also, the PCI Express bus will still derive its speed from that same unchanged clock with a 12.5 times multiplier to yield 2.5 GHz or thereabouts last time I checked the specs. This means that if you run an application which depends more on video cards or RAM than the processor, you might notice little if any improvement from this upgrade. You may still notice a, a drastic improvement if you run something more CPU bound though. Assuming it was only using some amount of the RAM's bandwidth and peripherals, and that it wasn't bottlenecking there or ready to start with. So a completely CPU bound application would probably really benefit in that kind of situation. But by contrast, the Socket 4 Pentium running at the system clock without any multipliers appears a measly 10% faster than the 60 MHz model it replaces on paper, which is a welcome improvement on its own, it's not small, but then you realise that the rest of the computer is probably getting a 10% boost too. Indeed, the 30 MHz PCI bus now becomes a as specified 33 MHz bus, and even the RAM and cache will probably be running quite a bit faster now. These are still 15 nanosecond chips as well, proving even further that unless you have a particularly RC motherboard, there's little reason for 12 nanosecond chips on about 99% of 486 motherboards. Unless you can do really tight timings or something, and even then, I'm kind of sceptical now. Anyway, that's a good start, and certainly suggests there isn't some kind of bottleneck going on on this particular motherboard. PC Player is now 10.92% faster, with 19.3 versus the old score of 17.4. Well, that seems nice and consistent, and it's well within the margins here. Top Bench breaks the trend, with 9.52% boost to its previous score, now scoring 230 versus a previous score of 210. Interestingly, my fastest 486 could probably edge ahead in this test, but yeah, that's probably down to top bench being 16-bit, and the fact Pentium was really optimised for the cutting-edge 32-bit applications of the day. This may even be the same in some other 16-bit tests, but this isn't the point of the exercise today, really. We're just comparing the system to itself with a different clock speed. That makes things easy because we can use any test under nearly any conditions provided they're the same for both clock speeds and ignore everything else. I only really mention it in passing for something I want to say later in this video about a different platform. Moving on, SpeedSys and my capture gear don't want to play ball right now but whatever. It gives us a numerical score for the CPU and with 49.14 versus the old score of 4424 which sounds like a time signature in music, there's a nice 11.08% boost. Uh, as that test is meant to be CPU only, I don't really understand why that might happen. Probably just simply because of the bus that it's travelling over, I suppose, but I don't know, that just seems a bit odd to me. Possibly, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Doom is mandatory, and it seems to get around 1980 ticks. Lower is better in the tick count, so that's faster than the old score of 2191, by all of 10.66% I think, so we're still consistent here. The average frame rate should be around 37.72 at 66MHz and 34.08 for the 60MHz model, which is probably a noticeable improvement in places. Quake needs a Pentium 75 apparently. Yeah, that's nonsense. This Pentium 66 is going to eat it for breakfast. Actually, to me, the 66 MHz test looks blisteringly fast in places. I'm very impressed. About 18.8 .8 frames per second average versus 17.0, uh, or about 10.59% faster than it was. Very, very playable. I'm happy from 12 frames per second up on most things, so yeah, this is, this is just fine to me. A 1.8 frame per second increase doesn't sound like much with everybody wanting 60 frames per second these days, and I'm not saying you shouldn't, that's perfectly healthy, but either way, including the percentages there hopefully helps you appreciate how much of a big deal this is, or at least it would have been at the time. When Kirk came out, 60 frames per second wasn't really a thing, at least nothing more than a distant dream for most people. In general, you were glad if your computer ran it at all, and by 
Run it, I mean, you'd probably invite your friends over to have a party if your machine could sustain double figures consistently in the latest 3D games and not crash every 10 minutes, even if the game turned out to be no good. These tests seem to indicate that on average we're going to see around a 10.65% improvement in performance versus using the machine with a 60 MHz processor. That's nice. You can certainly feel this difference, and where I have felt it most is Grand Theft Auto. The interesting fact, and more figures for you, is that the processor if we take that as the only measurement here, we're actually achieving about one frame per second per watt in Quake with this particular processor. And so, yeah, you think that's kind of good, you know. We're, we're obviously running quite efficiently here. It's better than the old processor. And to realise that this 10% gain is achieved by using about 15.02% more power than the old processor did. The old processor, I, well, I'll check it on a reference here rather than looking away. It's on the screen anyway because I've got guidelines for this. The processor we're using is about 17.28 watts. The old one's about 15.28. So, yeah, you're actually wasting a little bit of electricity. The, the efficiency curve's obviously wearing off here. If you look at efficiency curves for processors, you know, power consumption versus performance, and I made a chart up with later processors here, typically what will happen is you will get a point where it will increase exponentially as opposed to fairly linearly, and at that point the manufacturer, if they've got any wits about them, will modify the design, usually shrink the die, make the processor more efficient to stop it just burning electricity for no good reason, because then the gain's just not worth it, and it produces a lot of heat and all of that. Now evidently Intel did this because they moved to socket 5, the processors in that chart. The 75 MHz Pentium uses substantially less than these processors do. And you can see somewhere between the 120 and 133, there's a major increase in power consumption and then suddenly a major decrease, which implies Intel changed something inside the CPU again at that point to continue making it more efficient and use less power, yet yield the same performance. And this is the thing, clock isn't everything, as I've always said, and energy efficiency is a big part of it. It's not... It's no use having a very fast processor if it's just going to eat electricity. It's going to cost everyone a fortune. It probably won't last as long. And, yeah, it's, it's just not a good thing. And you can see AMD and Cyrix seem to follow this same trend as pretty much any manufacturer would unless they were complete idiots. Now, one thing I have to say about this little chart I've made is the fact that it doesn't use thermal design power. I don't believe in thermal design power because I don't really think it's standardized how to measure it. It's just a, a wank word, as some people would say, and I like that phrase. I think that sums it up. So I'm using raw power consumption, the, the, the usually worst case power consumption, but it's, it's pretty much the same even if you just use regular average power consumption or lowest power consumption. The, the, the chart's going to look pretty much the same there. TDP is really just like writing PMPO on a stereo in the 80s. <laughs> it's just marketing words. You just put a number there, that looks good. It, it's like measuring your dick in millimetres and then just putting a number without anything to denote what measurement it actually is. It might look impressive, but it doesn't really mean it's any good. So, yeah, that's something worth considering. And especially when you think that now this processor is vastly more powerful than these ones that use a measly 3 watts. And these processors have multiple cores on board and everything. It's ridiculous. Technology sure has come a long way since this stuff. Excellent! Now there are a few more things that are worth observing here. And one of them is, on this chart here, you can see the two lines on this spider chart that represent the Pentium show a fairly linear increase in performance. However, we bring in the uh, Hooker, which is still the fastest X5 on uh, VLB in the, the world that I know of. I haven't seen one top it yet, but 
that's not to say one doesn't or will not exist and uh, I welcome you to kick my ass on it as I always say but yeah you can see at 160 megahertz it shows that it's not linear versus a 486 indeed the the 486 platform scores a little bit lower in one of the tests and it seems to vary quite wildly by how much faster it's going to go at this clock speed and keep in mind that clock speed 160 megahertz for reference sake it can do the doom time demo in about 58 frames a second average but in theory given a linear increase on a pentium up to that clock speed we'll be able to do it in probably about 92 according to my calculations which i've just checked that's why i'm looking over there which is kind of interesting assuming it would be linear but by then you probably have to introduce clock multipliers and yeah you might you'd get a loss somewhere but i still think it would be faster and it implies what i've always said that the pentium's 1.5 times faster on average than a 486 but not at everything and that's something we'll run into later when I'm on about how much faster Pentiums are and stuff at some point yeah based on that you know a 486 would probably have to be doing at least 100 120 megahertz to match that Pentium in most tasks but the fact that it's in most tasks and not everything and the performance between them does vary quite a bit depending on what you're doing. Wants me to point something out which is a, a subject for another video but I'm going to go over it briefly because I get asked every once in a while what's the best device for this but they're quite ambiguous questions. It's like what's the best graphics card for Windows 95 and it's like well I don't know because I don't know what you're trying to do with Windows 95. Are you just looking at the interface or do you want to run like games on there and what kind of like programs do you want to run are they using DirectX are they using GL are they using GDI <laughs> are they DirectShow what, what are you doing I don't know what card to suggest because I don't know what you're trying to do with it you know it's pointless me saying oh well buy like an S3 Verge they're brilliant in Windows 95 which they are Unless you want to run like Interstate 76 or something, then it's fucking awful. So, you know, in that case, I'd be like, well, I'd, I'd fuck off cards from that time and maybe skip ahead a couple of years, maybe buy like a, a TNT 2 or something because they, they, they'd probably kick the shit out of that and they'd still be good at the interface side of things. But if you want to do things that are more GDI based or, you know, like Windows Adventure Games might use GDI or, or a lot of them don't, but still even ones that are just purely software based are probably still going to run better on like a, a Verge or, or a Mac or something as in ATI Mac 64 than they, they may do on like some of the 3D accelerated cards so that's the thing to consider as always it, it always depends what you're doing which hardware works best which you know is, is why I, I sometimes won't say that something is hands down the best I was like, maybe it's the best at being something, but it's not the best flat out at something. So, yeah, that's... And that, that little diagram there shows that up nicely. There is quite a large gap in some of the tests, in both directions as well. And that, that is worth observing and worth keeping in mind. I'm not saying don't ask questions, uh, just if you leave out details like that, I'll ask for more information before I can have a go at answering it. Is all and I don't mind like I say I'm, I'm open to people asking me stuff knowledge is there you what use is knowledge if it's not shared that would be bloody pointless and it's one of the reasons I do this so yeah anyway back on point so now we move on to answering the question I posed at the start of this video would this have ever been any good for the money it cost well so this question, would this thing have ever been a viable platform when it was new, or at least relatively new? Well, you know, there's a lot of factors there. We know how it performs now, but obviously it's no use if it costs too much. It may be cost prohibitive. Well, pretty much every computer was cost prohibitive in the early 1990s. However, I discovered that Intel actually lowered the price of the Pentium and its 486 line 
in early 1994, and they proposed this as early as January, as we can find in old InfoWorld articles, and I link to this article in the video description, because it's quite an interesting read, and it does rate a good point about computing at the time. High performance applications didn't use x86 that much back then. x86 was kind of the new guy, didn't have much of a foothold there just yet, and... Well, yeah, it, it was usually done on risk processors still, but x86 was getting there, and it was getting there quite quick as well. So, we know that, but having lowered both processors' prices, well, that, that means the 486 is still somewhat over half the cost of a Pentium chip, and those prices are for quantities of 1,000. I told you this stuff used to be very expensive. However, if we actually look at the price of systems, the Pentiums tend to be just a few hundred dollars more. Yeah, just a few hundred dollars. And the 66 megahertz model isn't usually that much more expensive, all things considered. When you're paying that much, an increase like that probably isn't that substantial. It's just saving a little longer. So, yeah, if you want performance, maybe. I, I don't know. We need to think about this a little more. So... You know, what's going on in the world? Well, the 486DX4 isn't out yet. That's not going to happen. So if you want performance at that level, well, we we do know that a Pentium 60 and 66 are about the performance of a of fast 486, usually between 100 and 120 megahertz, which is where the 486 platform would run out of steam. And whilst you could upgrade socket for the overdrives, uh, just not really some I'd consider. They would have been expensive. The same with the 486, the X5, the 586, and the Pentium overdrive. I don't believe would have been a feasible solution back then. They're good chips now, but back then I don't know. And we'll get into that in a in a moment as well. So, based on how much they cost and how they perform. I actually think for a short time, before Socket 5 came out, but not right at the beginning of the, the Pentium's lifespan, this thing would actually have been a viable machine. I think it would have been a worthwhile investment to get a 66 MHz Pentium back then, but only the 66 MHz one. That if you got a 60 MHz one, I think you probably wasted your money if you were going for performance. We're assuming you need that performance now. You know, because if you can wait out socket 5, it, it was kind of known you'd have done better to wait for it. And if you wanted budget, yeah, 486. But the reason I'd recommend it for performance over a 486 at that time is simply because if you bought that 486 and it was performance you were after, well, you might do fine, but you're going to have to upgrade it at some stage to get this level of performance. And we already know how expensive processors were. And it so happens that processors seem to cost about as much as the Pentium costs more than the 486 in the first place. So, yeah, upgrading that 486, you've just nullified any money you saved in buying it in the first place. So if you plan to, you know, you need that level of performance later on, mm, yeah, you, you, you may as well have bought the Pentium by the time you pay for it, really, in my opinion. But yeah, some people do things differently. And those last minute upgrades to the 486, the, the X5 and the overdrive and everything, I've always said I don't believe they were worth it. I mean, by the time that happened, you'd probably have been looking at, you know, if you had a machine from a, a year or two earlier and you still needed something faster, you probably wouldn't have been looking at forking out all this money to upgrade obsolete hardware by then. You would have been thinking, mm, maybe we'll just hang on to it and upgrade it to something better, because this platform seems to be a dead end now. But it stands for both platforms. The 486 had nothing left to give that was ever going to come out anyway, and the, the Pentium on Socket 4 really didn't. The overdrive chips might work well, I don't know, I don't have any, and they're made out of unicorn shit basically, you won't find them. Uh, they come up occasionally, but I'm not, <laughs> I've, I've no interest in getting one. It's just, I don't, I don't know. So I think for a short time it was viable. But there is a, a few interesting points about all of this stuff, which is that Intel lowered its prices by such a drastic amount. Now, why would that happen, do you suspect? Well, it could be that Intel's chips just didn't sell that great at the time, you know, and people didn't seem that interested in the Pentium, yet it wasn't 
really viable sometimes, they thought, or it was too expensive, they reasoned. But, yeah, why was it too expensive and why weren't people interested in it? Well, I'll tell you why, because Intel's best buddies, AMD and Cyrix, were really outpricing them and kind of trying to match the performance of quite a few of their products and somewhat succeeding at doing it as well, which wasn't really good because it lost Intel quite a lot of money, I would imagine. And being a business, Intel kind of, like, drinks and breathes and eats money. That's kind of its purpose for being as a, a, a corporation. <laughs> Take the money away and it will die. So, yeah, yeah, it's a lower prices there, which is a great thing. Because competition, this, this is further proof that competition will benefit any industry. Or at least it, what it will benefit most in that industry is the end user of the product. So... In this case, it made computers cheaper, yet you got better performance at the same price, obviously, because the price is dropped. And probably somewhere accelerated technology, because, well, let's face it, you know, AMD is kind of getting to grips with this stuff. They're probably going to try bringing faster processors out, and you can take them to court, but is that even going to work? And Cyrix is there, and... You know, well, this could be bad, because they might make something faster. So, yeah, Intel has to make something faster as well. And like I say, who benefits from that? Well, it, it drops the prices of the previous generation of hardware then, so it gets even cheaper. And then the war's still going to continue, because the other company's going to come up with their products, and it's brilliant. That's how things should be done. And that, that's one thing that worries me now, because AMD don't seem to have anything to answer back to Intel as, as well today so maybe the industry could stagnate and the prices could inflate unreasonably it's, it's a scary concept a one horse race a, a monopoly it's, it's not a very good thing and another example of competition benefiting the end user in technology at least technology is kind of my thing but I mean you could use other industries I'm pretty certain it would happen in the car industry and everything as well or even double glazing probably and traffic cones almost anything is most likely subject to this i would imagine but yeah it, in technology certainly one of the things everybody knows which is why i'm using it is the 16-bit console war between nintendo and sega i mean i love the super nintendo the best out of both of them but i really respect the mega drive and i probably love the mega drive almost as much I don't hate either console. I jerk with my friend because he, he grew up on the Mega Drive and he likes that better. I grew up on the Super Nintendo. I like that better. But liking it better, a lot of it's probably just the nostalgia factor. They're both great systems. But do you think for one second that the Super Nintendo would have turned out as good if Sega hadn't shown up and been like, hey, hey Nintendo, guess what? Fuck you, your console's a piece of shit. We've got this new one, it's going to kick your ass." And, uh, yeah, Genesis does motherfucker and all of that shit. Well, yeah, they probably wouldn't have seen a Super Nintendo, at least not for a long time if Sega hadn't done that. And it probably wouldn't have been as good if Sega hadn't done that, because all of a sudden they're getting, you know, out outdone on every front. They're, it's better technology, Sega's trying to lower prices on things. So, yeah, this probably isn't a good thing. Nintendo's got to get their arse into gear and get somehow to compete with it on like quality and price and everything they can muster just to uh, not really lose out if and it, it gets to a point where if either company fucks up they can lose market share overnight and neither one's going to let up they're going to constantly be at each other's throats so very rapidly you've got well you've got this new console nintendo but we've got better games than you and then it's like well fuck you sega we've got better games than you and it's probably one of the most visual representations of how this works. That if you look at launch titles on the Super Nintendo versus late game titles from when the system was going out, sure is a drastic change there, isn't there? From, you know, even somewhere after launch where you've got games like Super Mario World, or like F-Zero even, which is a great game and it was very good for its time. I love F-Zero, but yeah, it's kind of not in the same league technically as Stunt Race FX, which is another brilliant game, or things like that, or you had like Donkey Kong Country towards the end, it was a great platformer, and yeah, it sure as hell looks and sounds a lot better than Super Mario World, 
And I don't doubt it's in part because of that competition. If, if that wasn't there, it might have still been good, but it probably wouldn't have been as good, and it probably would have cost even more to buy these damn things. So, competition. Every industry needs it. It's a good thing. <laughs> I honestly think it's it's kind of a shame that there's not as much now. I'd love it if Cyrix was still around making processors. You know, I'd love it if S3 was still making really good video cards and not just a, a logo owned by Viro or whoever has them now. It would be brilliant and we'd probably have much better technology than we have now. So that's that. And that the last thing I want to do today, that's been quite a long little rant, but I think it's worthwhile. So we have answered the question. I do think for a brief time, Socket 4 was viable, but only at 66 megahertz. 60 megahertz, no, because then you're going to have to upgrade it like you would the 486, and then you're just going to be forgetting all the fighting anything you saved. You're probably going to be in debt. <laughs> you're probably going to have some angry man knocking at your door or kicking the door in in a few months and breaking your thumbs. So yeah <laughs> there's that but yeah. the other thing we're going to do is i have a 486 motherboard which i've had for a while we have seen it briefly before it's a first international computer 486 vip ir which is a seemingly not too uncommon motherboard it seems to be around uh, fairly often uh, with varying features on board they seem to have fiddled with things back and forth a little bit there seems to be a few different variations but they're pretty minor and this motherboard, you can get it to run 586 processors. I, I've done it, and I've fucked around with the BIOS on mine. But it doesn't have proper PCI, as far as I can tell. And that is another factor on Socket 4, is the fact that the PCI implementation would kick the shit out of the one on the 486. It wouldn't be perfect, but it would certainly be better than the 486's implementation at that time at least the majority of the time. There probably was some good 486 boards, but eh, few and far between, and expensive. Probably a waste of money, really, if you really, really needed PCI and you wanted it to be the best it could be. So, yeah, this board has a pretty awful implementation, and I've spoken about bridges and crappy PCI before, and this motherboard's going off to uh, another enthusiast uh, dude who calls himself Brassic Gamer, he's, uh, he wants a VLB board, and he's aware of this board's shortcomings, I, I'm not, <laughs> I haven't gone to the guy, hey man, I got this board, it's awesome, I've gone, I got this board, it's pretty mediocre, and the PCI implementation sucks, but it's work, it works, you can have it if you want it, basically, uh, so yeah, I'm sending him that, he might send me some stuff, and, uh, well, it, I don't use the board, so, hey, that's good, it'll go somewhere and get some use, won't it, but, yeah, before I, I get rid of it, I figure we might as well take a look at this performance just to see how badly this thing suffers on on its PCI implementation. I mean, we tested the, in the, my Pentium Overdrive and we know VLB is probably going to be faster on a 486, but yeah, how much faster? We, we know it's not that much faster, surely. Maybe there'll be a little bit of loss somewhere. Well, I don't know. We'll have to test it out. And I'm only going to test it in Doom. I can't bother to do anything else. And there's probably not much point in doing anything else. So, yeah, here's the tests as they showed up. And, well, I'll, we'll talk about them in a, in a little while when they're done. It's a bit pointless doing that beforehand. Let's just get some suspense going here. So, this is the last chance I have to demonstrate this thing in action. I'm not sure it really is a bridge or if it's just a particularly crappy PCI implementation but we shall see just how rough this motherboard's idea of PCI truly is. Doom runs as it always does so we're not going to wait for that to complete and we'll just skip ahead once you've got a feel for how slow it is. Oh man I think that's probably enough so yeah that's a gap if there ever was one right there. Using the same CPU and the same RAM and everything, only the video card's been changed, it's on a 133 megahertz AMD X5 processor, and the video cards are the Trio 64's we used in when we tested them in the Pentium Overdrive. Changing the, the PCI card for VLB yields a massive, massive difference, wait for it, 24.22% increase in speed we have just witnessed. What the fuck? This is around a terrible 20.31 frames per second for the PCI versus a 
as somewhat less terrible, 25.23 for Visa Local Bus. I don't have too much to say about this, and I just thought it was interesting. It's certainly something to look out for if you're, you're in a market for 486 boards. That could really upset somebody. It fits with this video because being similar in age to the Pentium board, it helps share what I was saying about early PCI implementations, especially on the 486 platform. I think it's no coincidence that the majority of the better PCI 486 boards came later, usually 1995 onwards, such as the one in my Pentium Overdrive, the popular Biotech 8433 UUD, and even the PC chips M919, which is surprisingly decent for a low-cost motherboard, and it probably improves drastically if you can get one of those dodgy cache modules I've been desperately trying to reverse engineer in my spare time. Well, I've got to be honest, that's bloody awful. But I don't have much to say about it. I, I suspect we could get both tests to run a bit faster if I played with settings in the BIOS and stuff. But I can't be bothered, I just left everything pretty much stock. Because it, that wasn't the point of the test, we're just seeing how much faster the VLB interface goes on there. It goes quite a bit faster, <laughs> that's... Yeah, what percentage was that? Uh, 24.22? Yeah, that's probably awful. I, I, I don't really know why that's so bad. Like I said, I think it used a bridge. I'm not 100% sure. Maybe it's just a really crappy PCI implementation. It, it has some issues with, like, Ethernet cards locking the system up if you don't you set some jumpers right and certain things in the bias. It's, it's a bit of a weird implementation. It, it works, but it's not real quick. And it was fitting to this video because it displays what I was saying about the Socket 4 PCI implementation generally being better. It was a bit of a risk with the 486. I mean, back then, how were you going to know that before you bought the motherboard? <laughs> you weren't. You'd have to buy the bloody thing and then you'll find out. And you can't return it, most likely. You can't just walk back to the store and go, Hey, uh, I bought this motherboard. It doesn't go as fast as I'd like it to go. I want a different one. It stores really still aren't sometimes but definitely i don't think they would have been anywhere near as accepting as they are now i mean even in the early 2000s a lot of computer shops would refuse returns i remember maplin electronics not even a computer store you take any component back and they'd be like oh no that's a, a component we don't accept returns on those because there's too many factors that you know it basically devoids us of any responsibility you had to fight and fight, even if the thing was broken completely. You know, you'd open a box uh, for a, a sound card, and it would be in two pieces. And they'd be like, "Oh no, that's a component. We don't accept returns." So yeah, in the mid 1990s, well, about 94 is when all these boards were from. You know that we've spoke today were from 93, 94. That the Airbit PS5 and the the Fic 486 VIP are both from 94, it seems. <laughs> Imagine trying to return a board back then, especially because it costs more. The store definitely isn't going to want to give you that money back. And that's assuming you had a store to buy it from. You might have had to order it out of a, a, the back of a magazine or a, a catalogue or something, and then you'd be screwed and you may have to mail it back, and then you'd probably never see it again. Maybe never see the money again either, so you're a bit of a pain in the ass, really, all things considered. It's probably no surprise that the better 486 PCI boards came much later than the time period we're discussing in this video, or a little later, uh, as in 95 onwards, when things like the one in my Pentium Overdrive turned up, or the popular Biotech MB8433 UUD, which I misjudged. It, it seems to be a really good board that I think I just got a, a bad one when I had one. It, it was dead, so you know I don't regret destroying the thing for the entertainment value because it, it was fucked. It didn't work at all. It, it conked out. So, whatever. And of course, the PC chips M919 is quite commonplace and isn't actually a, a particularly bad motherboard, it doesn't seem. At least, as it was probably a cheap motherboard, I'd say it was certainly okay in its time. And if you could get the cache module for one, well, then it would probably be even better, but yeah, they seem to be pretty snappy without that. So, yeah, if you wanted a cheap machine in 1995 and weren't that asked about performance or anything, it would probably have been more than adequate, but still, I think, a poor investment at that time because you were on a, a dying platform. 
but yeah, I don't know. You've probably been good for a little while. Anyway, I'm, I'm high trees and I don't really have anything else to say today. I suppose I should say where I am with shit, like the move. <laughs> no idea. I've heard nothing. So I, I don't know what's happening with that. Uh, I wish I'd known that in advance. But that's not happening. And I think last time I was on here I said I'd do a video on a laptop that I have. As in I'd do it next as in it would have been this video. And yeah, that's what I had planned. But there's a piece of hardware and it's not for the laptop. But it will help greatly. To It'll make the video about a million times better. I thought it was obscure and expensive. Turns out that now it's quite common and actually really quite cheap. So... <laughs> I uh, figured, well, I can't afford one right now, but I probably will be able to somewhere in the, the non-too-distant future. So I might just have to get hold of one of those and hold off making that video until I get my hands on this uh, contraption, because it will be very useful and it will make the video better, I believe. But I think that's about it for today. I'm High Treason, thank you very much for watching, and I really mean that, because this channel's still growing it as well, and so... Yeah, thank, thank you to everybody who's new here as well. Everybody watching this, basically, you're all awesome. I, thanks for watching, as, as, as usual. I, I'm High Treason, and I'll see you again when I can. Here's my canary. His name's Pip. And he's mostly roller canary. I think he's about 15 years old now, but yeah, he's uh, he's suddenly aged. He's uh, what are you looking at? What? You attention whoring dogs, you. Yeah. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of years on the clock. You're still the most handsome cock bird around, aren't you, Pippet? Do you have some connection to these? We stayed in this room. It's a shame he's not singing no more. Because his, uh, his ruler canary blood it, uh, makes him very, very good at singing. Uh, yeah. Hey, dog. He gets jealous <laughs> quickly. That one. Whereas him, he don't care that much. Look. Bin boy. Bin boy. She's a bit adventurous to do. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, she was nowhere near that a moment ago. She can evidently remember where things are in a web on both sides. I didn't know that. Bloody hell, she's getting aggressive with that. It's dead already, you already killed it. <laughs> Come on, I want to strike. I'm going to get one on camera. See, there's already been one or two. This little fella he looks like he might go for it. That fly keeps rattling his uh, his threads there.
Have you the spiders move towards where they know there's food? They all start surrounding the fruit flies. Poor little flies. <laughs>